Sagas and Seascapes is a program um, connecting stories across the Western seaboard, all the way from Ireland, where one of our composers, Linda Buckley, comes from, through into Scotland and the Northern Isles and onwards to the Faroes and Iceland. And it traces in music the journey through the sagas and the connections that are made through that. I really wanted to come up to Orkney and, and place um, this music in, in the landscape and, and also to share some time with the composers. I'm really fascinated to see how they react to the landscapes, how it feels for them to return um, and get a sense of the emotion in the music that, that they feel um, when they're connected to, to those places and how they translate that into music and, and the emotions that come through that. My name is Orla Stevens and I am a Scottish artist and I'm based in central Scotland and I focus primarily on landscape painting. I have known the organiser Catherine Wren since I was nine years old um, and she taught me violin. She invited me to join in with the project to bring a visual perspective to um, all of the pieces of music that have been created. I suppose I'm used to creating work which is my own response to things and the challenge for me is being sensitive enough to the composers and their ideas and translating their visions of the music and, and how they think and feel about them and making sure that they are happy with what I'm producing. I suppose it's not just producing for myself and hoping that other people respond and resonate with it, it's producing the work which is also in keeping with so many different people's ideas. The medias that I mainly use are acrylics with chalks and oil pastels and I really like the way which you can combine them all and layer them up um, to reference the different parts of the landscape. I work very intuitively and very quickly, um, when I'm, especially when I'm out, on, out in the open. I've been using my sketchbooks a lot to be very, very quick with my drawing and it's been amazing to have the luxury of such good weather whilst we've been here, which has given me a lot more time than I would normally have. Normally have like two, three minutes before it rains or something like that. When the project's all wrapped up, we're going to be planning a live performance where we'll be able to exhibit the paintings alongside the music and hopefully we'll be able to view them simultaneously whilst you're listening. And that should give you a bit more of a in-depth kind of experience of what, where we've been and, and what the project's all about. And I'd love to hear about how your new piece was inspired by the story and by this place? Like, is it very much connected to, to your sense of the landscape here as well? Oh, yes, because um, the first time I went to um, look out from Bursey towards uh, Egglesey, you know, I was immediately thinking, ah, this is, this is where Magnus was and this sailed to school, because he went to school on Egglesey. So he would have been backwards and forwards on um, wooden Viking boats going to the monks to go to school because it's quite a, well for those times a huge settlement on this tiny island and Then when he went there for the peace treaty trip It would have been familiar to him that journey that sea journey. He was going for a different reason mm. And he's still quite a young man But I don't know whether you know the story of him becoming a pacifist when he was a teenager mm. bizarre thing for a Viking yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because mm. yeah. he'd been trained as a warrior and was apparently very good. Yeah. Um, I imagine that's bows and arrows mostly. And they set off for some battle in the Menai Straits. And uh, during this um, battle, he, he said that he wasn't going to fight anymore. And he put down his weapons and started praying. And you know, the others all said, you're mad, you're going to be killed. Mm. But he wasn't. So that was the start of people thinking there was something special about him. Mm. Uh, he'd apparently been saved in this battles when there was arrows flying all around him. What age did he live to? I actually don't know that. I should know, shouldn't I? Well, he died in yeah. 1117. Yeah, I can't remember when he was um, born. I think he would have been in his 20s. Really? Yeah, that's a oh. slight guess, but, yeah, he was quite young when he died. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really sad, actually. Mm. Yeah. Except he did bring peace in another way. Yeah because the two sides of the, the family, there were the, mm -hmm. the two earls that had ruled jointly, but the two sides had not got on mm -hmm. after his death. Uh, Hakon, the, the one who was responsible for the death, he went mm -hmm. to Magnus's mother and told her what had happened and expecting there'd be even more trouble. And she said, no, this is gonna be the end of the fighting. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, she was a very strong woman, apparently Thora. Mm -hmm. So she was the one that created the piece. Mm -hmm. I've known Gemma McGregor for a few years and Nordic Viola commissioned um, Carry His Relics from Gemma. Gemma's always had a very close connection with the Orkney Inga saga um, and a, a real deep interest in St Magnus and his story. And at the time we commissioned the piece, um, the St Magnus Way had, had just come into being the long distance walk through Orkney. And Gemma decided to write a piece that traced that journey um, when St Magnus's relics were carried through the islands and the different landscapes, a sense of journeying again um, through, through the island and its landscape. And I love the music. There's the viola part has a very solid processional idea to it. And above that, the flute kind of has bird calls, I guess, and lots of atmosphere. Um, this idea of being in, in the place and, and the journey that his relics take. When you write chamber music, you might think, oh, surely the less instruments you've got, the simpler it is. So writing a duo may be much easier than writing a sextet. But in fact, if you've got a lot to say in sound and having the different timbres of instruments and different registers that they play in, you've got a lot more choice. So with only two, you've got to work with quite simple forces and try to create colour and drama with just two instruments. But these particular instruments, the flute and viola, suited me quite well because I wanted to imitate birdsong, which of course the flute is perfect for. And I wanted to have a kind of nod towards old string instruments like viols, so the viola could make some quite earthy low sounds as well.
I first heard Else When when Lily wrote it for the um, St Magnus Composers course back in 2017 and I just thought it was such an evocative piece of music. It really captures the eeriness of, of the ancient landscapes, the Stones of Stennis, Maze Howe. Um, and I think it's really important for music to um, be heard more than once and to um, develop its own life, I think, and, and find its place in the repertoire. Um, Elswen was inspired by um, various ancient sites around Orkney that I researched before I came to the St Magnus Composers course in 2017. I would, I would describe Elswen as quite mysterious um, because nothing is certain in, in the piece or in obviously in reality in the sites. Um, it's about, it's all about imagining and empathy and like empathising across time um, and to finding that shared human connection with people that you've never met and that whose society is so different to yours, and you can never imagine it, but there's something unifying across them. So Lily, is this the first time you've been to these stones? This is actually the second time I've been. Um, I came when I went on the St Magnus Composers course in 2017. When you get close to them, there's almost like a, an internal subconscious barrier that you you kind of want to reach out and touch. Be like, I'm not, I'm not sure if I should. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> is that kind like? Of, there's like, like like a magical little aura around them that that this that they're special and should I? I th I'll, I'll just stay a foot back. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And that's the sort of that's the sort of feeling I was doing in my my piece. That sense that um, there's something tangible still left in the stones, and we're not sure what it is, but there's you can sense something and. I think that was what I felt when I came here the first time. I was, I was like, okay, yeah, I, there's something really, really special here. And it's not just the quiet and it's not just the natural space. It's the, it's the stones and the history that's here. I think, yeah, I was, I was pleased when I came that it, I was like, I think I've got that feeling for me, right? I imagined how I would feel and how, how interested I am in them. And, and I think I got it about right. There's, there's a, yeah, it's unknown something, something big unknown that's around you.
Ellie Towson's piece um, tells us a story of, of, of the Selkie legends, which are, are common to um, all the northern cultures around, around the North Atlantic. And the idea of the seals transforming um, into human form and, and luring people with, with their cries. And I, I was just really fascinated by the idea that these stories are shared um, in, in slightly different forms. Um, and I love the kind of quixotic nature of Ellie's music, the fact that it all changes so quickly and there's different moods and we go from kind of quite slow music to very fast moving, rhythmic, quixotic music, which I guess reflects the seal transforming into another being.
Fogan is a piece by Carrie Beck, who's one of the most prominent composers in the Faroe Islands. And um, yeah, it's a German title um, depicting waves. And I, again, it's this quixotic movement that, that attracts me to the music, the ever-changing face of the sea, um, its solemnity. Um, there's a hymn-like section at the end, which for me recalls um, the, the fishermen and, and, and the feelings that, that they have and the trust that they place in their faith, I think, when they're, when they're out at sea and the dangers of sea, but also the, the playfulness of the ocean as well, the rapidly changing colours in the music.
want to take people on a journey, really. We took um, the story of Ord um, from the Icelandic sagas um, as a starting point, and I commissioned Linda Buckley to write a piece on her because she spent a lot of time in Iceland and knew a lot about Icelandic music and the sagas and the connections between people. I was really kind of fascinated to find out um, whether we could trace the line of Ord really through um, Orkney um, and into her descendants. Um, and not only that, but we can actually trace that line through across into the Orkney Inga saga and ultimately through to St Magnus. And I just think it's, it's actually fascinating that we can follow these journeys. I'm Linda Buckley and I'm an Irish composer and my piece is called Odd. Um, and I, I think with Odd, I really connected with the sense of um, strength and resilience um, from her journeying, um, from her bravery, from her also um, courage through times of grief. Um, there was a lot of loss in her life, a lot of sadness, but she really overcame this and um, kind of triumphed in the world and sort of um, became one of the, the most respected women in Iceland. have it in my mind's eye of like people like Ord coming from Caithness and just sailing around that and coming in here into Stromness maybe. I wonder what made her go and travel on. There's a lot of different theories about that. I mean, yeah. I think she had always intended to eventually go up to Iceland. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the timing of why she she went when she did. Mm -hmm. Maybe she just felt she had her business was done here and she could move northwards. Mm -hmm. Did you say it was it was a legend that her boat was sort of secret in Kethness? Mm -hmm. So there was a story that she had heard that her husband had died and she was very in the middle of kind of grief mm -hmm. and decided she wanted to leave mm -hmm. and had this long ship built in the forest secretly mm. um, and then planned the journey to Orkney. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody knows why it was so secretive, mm -hmm. really. She just, I think she just had this little plan and kind of wanted to mm -hmm. um, make sure it would come to fruition without telling everybody, maybe. Yeah, or maybe because she was female and people might not have thought she could do it. Also, yeah, yeah. I think that's a big part Possibly. of it. Yeah. And then she sailed on her own? She had a crew with her um, and the crew went up to Iceland. Yeah, breathe a few. That's right. And I wonder how old she was because, I mean, well, I think they reckon she was probably about 50 when she died, but I mean... That was old then, then. It was old, but also, you know, I think from what you gather, she did quite a bit in Iceland after that time, so I reckon she must have been pretty young when she made that voyage. Mm. But I suppose I was interested in that, in the piece, that sense of kind of journeying. Mm -hmm. but also landing mm -hmm. so there's sort of you can maybe hear that in the music that there's sort of landing mm -hmm. points and journeying again yeah. landing points yeah um, and a sense of return and a sense of restlessness but a sense of peace at times as well mm -hmm. that gets erupted you know mm -hmm. so.
Back in June, we ran a competition, Sea Stories, for young people um, from the Northern Isles, the Faroes um, and Iceland. We wanted to connect them through the stories and the common landscapes um, that they all have. So we asked them to create a short piece of music based on their own experiences um, where they live um, and to um, put their emotions into music. Um, the winner was um, Annie Helena Lamhoger from the Faroe Islands and her piece was Corona Trot, which actually means um, I'm tired of Corona or I'm bored with Corona. <laughs> and, um, and Annie was sitting in, in her house looking out over the sea on a particularly dreech day out in the Faroe Islands <laughs> and wrote um, a kind of melancholy tune, but there's a lot of character in it. And we loved it when um, a shaft of light came across the piece, really. It changed key and um, the mood changed. And it's a very short piece, but it had lots of character and lots of personality to it. And yeah, we thought it really summed up um, what a lot of us have been feeling. Hi, my name is Annie Helena and I'm going to play a song that I wrote myself that's called Corona Trot. Corona Trot is a play on words of the fairy's word Trot, meaning tired, because I wrote the song a year ago when I was in quarantine. <laughs> Drome is a traditional tune and it's made its way into um, Danish um, folk music, but it actually is drawn from a Scottish melody, the drummer, um, very similar tune um, and shows the connections again of the um, folk traditions that were passed across the North Sea and the Atlantic through um, the fishermen and also the whaling fleets sharing their music when they were on land.